First of all, in the presentation by Commissioner Guerrero of the Bureau of Customs Roadmap and Scorecard in the Performance Public Governance Forum last November, Bureau of Customs received the Golden Trailblazers Award. And this is, a, this is quite an achievement because not all who go through the PGS get the Golden Trailblazer Award. And the other day, uh, if you read in the papers, uh, it was reported that last year, the Bureau of Customs have caught uh, a lot of smuggled goods valued at more than 20 billion pesos. I think you deserve congratulations for that. That's a lot of money uh, produced by the Bureau. And finally, uh, also the other day, you read that the Bureau of Customs uh, recorded the highest revenue collection ever in its history. Uh, almost 700 billion pesos, uh, making you the next uh, highest revenue generator for this government. A lot of good things are happening to the Bureau of Customs and hopefully uh, that will continue. We will go through crafting your personal roadmap defining what's important to you, defining what is your mission, what is your vision in life, crafting your personal scorecard. And this is a lot of hard work. The bold, audacious roadmap that your commissioner has presented to the public last November in a public governance forum will not happen unless it is supported by each and every Bureau of Customs employee. So the transformation cannot happen in the whole organization if there is no conversion in the middle and in the bottom of the organization. Just a simple survey. Who among you are stressed most of the time? Oh, okay. It's about 70% uh, of the group. Family, normally uh, by the parents, and by the grandparents in the family. The second driver of change is the school or the church. This is where values are strengthened, reinforced, and enhanced. Third, government. Government is a driver of societal change. And this is where values are practiced in the public sector and enterprise or business where values are practiced in the private sector. In summary, you have four drivers of change family, school, government, enterprise. And this is exactly what the advocacies are of the Center for Excellence in Governance. We work with families, good families, to become better families because that's where values are formed. We work with schools, several universities and other schools because that's where values are strengthened. And we work with both the public sector under the Institute for Solidarity in Asia and with corporations under the Institute of Corporate Directors. So we have all four sectors of society covered. But the foundation of all of these advocacies is really personal governance. You have to transform the individual before you can transform the whole organization. And that is why you are here today. And the definition of family governance, school governance, enterprise governance, or public governance are there for you to read. But the most important really is personal governance because this is where you as a human being manage yourself according to a plan of life. Uh, it's also a way of inventing your future by doing it today. You cannot govern others unless you first govern yourself. And you cannot share what you don't have. So these are basic principles in personal governance. Part two. Let's talk about crisis and change. In 1996, Michael Porter, the strategy guru, came to the Philippines and talked to us in the Management Association of the Philippines. And he said, if you don't not change the way you do things in the next five years, you will either lose your job, lose your business, or be, uh, or be working in another company, probably in a much lower position. He was dead wrong, and this is the guru. Why? Because in 1997, one year after he said this to us, came the Asian flu. And many, in 1997 and 1998, many lost their jobs, 
Many companies closed down and many had to settle for lower jobs. Then several years ago, I was in the same forum. I was a speaker in Malaysia. And together with me was another Harvard professor. His name is Dr. Lopovich. He wrote the best-selling book, The Power of Alignment. And he said there that D2 equals G2. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. Wrong again. Because these days, in the face of massive changes, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll be blasted out of the marketplace. You have to do something else faster, bigger, sooner. So, the 21st century so far has seen these things. Internet invasion. It has in, the internet has invaded our offices, our homes, our living rooms, our bedrooms, and like my grandchildren, even the bathroom. Because I don't know what's with these kids. They like to do computer work and surf the net in the bathroom while doing their thing. But it has invaded our lives. Their global uh, globalization of traditional and non-traditional media, uh, Facebook, Google, Instagram. You see uh, wars being fought in real time all over the world. And you have technological, disruptive technological uh, inventions, artificial intelligence, you have uh, Internet of Things, you're the fourth industrial revolution or fire going on as we speak. Converging technologies, before you needed a telephone just for calling people, you need a camera just to take pictures, uh, you need to go to the movie house to watch a movie, they're all now in your smartphones convergent technologies. You can do many things online. There are virtual factories, virtual living rooms, and even virtual nations. Like Facebook, how many hundred million subscribers to Facebook? They're a virtual nation by themselves. So these things are now facing us in this age. So our world today is on a fast forward, driven by technology, and we're all caught in it. Some of us, are free falling to obsolescence, ob obsolescence, obscurity, and oblivion. But some also are having the time of their lives, taking advantage of these disruptive developments. How do you explain this? So we go back 2,000 years or earlier. For millennials now, the world has gone through three economic ages, if you remember the agricultural age the industrial age, and then the information age. Sometime in the 1800s, somebody discovered steam engine and electricity. And so that triggered the change in the system from an agricultural-based economy to industrial economies. That took about 50, 75 years. During this age, the world powers were Spain, Portugal, uh, the Dutch, the French, and they conquered the world. But when industrialization came in the 1800s, new powers came about, the Americans, the Japanese, the Germans. And then in 1975, something happened that changed the world again. That was when the computer was, was invented. And the change uh, happened in the Philippines, if you believe. In 1975, if you remember the heavyweight title fight between uh, Frazier, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali, for those who are more than 39 years old, if you remember that, that fight was the first global telecast. And that was beamed out of Aranete Coliseum in Cubao, Quezon City, Philippines. For the first time, the world in real time saw what was happening in the other parts of the world. So Russia, Hungary, all of those communist countries who before did not have an idea of what hap what's happening in, in this part of the world, all of a sudden saw the fight in real time. And that changed the world. So from then you had now Telex and, and uh, all of these other developments. And that was started in Cuba in 1975. And that period continues up to now. It's called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So you have steam engine, you have electricity, you have computers, and now digitalization is the name of the game under the fourth industrial revolution. And this crisis will continue 
for a few more decades until we move fully into the knowledge age. Fortunately, we can learn from the Chinese. The Chinese ideogram for crisis is Wei Ji, danger and opportunity. So the Chinese say that if there is a crisis, there is danger, but there's also opportunity. And you have anxiety, fear, confusion, loss of control for the danger side and for the opportunity side. You have excitement, growth, innovation, and profitability. Think about the victims of crisis. There are many. The Soviet Union and the, um, the United States of America were engaged in a nuclear brinkmanship game for 70 years. Soviet Russia is no more. You have uh, the f largest airline in the world, for those of you who are old enough, Pan Am. Pan Am is not there anymore. Enron, one of the large energy companies, now gone. Even Lehman Brothers, one of the larger uh, financial institutions in the U.S., fell off the earth in the economic crisis in 2007-2008. Locally, you have Pantranco North, the biggest bus company in the country. Now, no more. You have DMG, who dared to produce an, a Filipino car and failed because the brand that they were carrying could not compete with the Japanese, and so on. On the other hand, there are also victors in crisis. Our country is an example of a victor in crisis. We went through a peaceful revolution and came up becoming the darlings of the world. And there are many others, the, the conglomerates that we have, uh, the Bill Gates and the, Stephen, the Steve Jobs of this world, they're all uh, victors in crisis. In all of these developments, you have to look at organizations and its economic age has its own organizational structure. Uh, organizations are set up to establish power, credibility, control, and predictability. And in the, in the agricultural age, there was only one organization. You have the king and you have the subjects. In the agricultural age, the son of the king became king. The son of the son of the king became king. This, the subjects remained the same. Only the seasons change during the agricultural age. And the, and the driving force of that age is natural order. And then the industrialization came. And the organizational structure changed. Now you have an hierarchy approach to organization. Governments up to now are, are organized this way. The military, corporations, even religions and schools are organized this way. If you're in the military, when you're a lieutenant, you become captain, you become major, you become colonel, you become general. And the driving force was obedience equals security. You obey the rules, uh, you don't do crazy things, you'll rise up in the organization. That was the industrial age. And then this changed. And now you see organizations structured like this. You have teams, organizations are flatter. It's now management by consent. They're autonomous, empowered employees, network around information, and so on and so forth. You can read them. And there's a culture of constant improvement and a culture of continuous learning. And this poses a challenge to many of those who still are in the old industrial age mindset. Organizations have shifted from that of dependence, depending on the leader, to independence, to interdependence. And so the transition of organizations from industrial age to the new age come in different formats. Whether it's the organizational structure, the expectations of workers, the kind of leadership uh, that is needed, the kind of workforce, the markets that you serve, and so on and so forth. So organizations have changed. The individual is inside the management structure. Now, the management structure is inside the individual because you have empowered individuals, empowered workers. So massive change, organizational change. Third is information overload. You now are subjected to information that are 10,000% higher than it was 10 years ago. A lot of information coming your way, whether you like it or not. 
But this is creating a lot of tension among peoples and organizations. And finally, the values gap. All of these changes that are going on create a situation where you're not getting what you want out of life. Your current reality and the vision for yourself, there's a certain major gap and that's called the values gap which is the difference between what you want life to be versus what the crap you're getting out of life. For example, we always dream that we can work maybe eight hours a day, 30 minutes, uh, 50 minutes for, yeah, 30 minutes for commute. So you can spend three hours with your family. You can relax for one and a half hours a day. You go uh, exercise uh, for an hour or so or your hobby. You communicate with friends and relatives, and then you have 20 minutes to pray every day. What are you getting these days? You are getting, in reality, 12 hours of work. It can be 15 hours, depending on whether you live in Makati or you live in Fairview, where the commute is anywhere from two to four hours. That's what we're getting. You don't have enough time for your family well, because of traffic, you can still read in the car or in the bus. So you are given one and a half hours. You don't have time to exercise and you only have 30 minutes to socialize and three minutes to pray. What kind of life is that? Now these days, what are the strong values these days? Power, sex, pleasure, money, technical efficiency. What is the truth? goodness, good, go, or even love. We're... So these are the values that our children, your children, your grandchildren are going through. They spend seven hours in front of the television set. And guess who controls the kind of programs that they see? The maid who chooses the inane uh, TV programs. And that's there's a lot of value transformation there but the wrong kind why because parents don't spend as much time with the children as they should the uh, interaction between parents and children these days is about two minutes per day hello goodbye how school find dad then they go off to whatever they're doing couples are luckier husbands and wife spend five minutes of of interactive, real interactive vision every day. So what does it all mean? You have massive changes driven by technology, rapid changes all over the world. You have organizational disruption because of the shift from the hierarchical structure to a more empowering structure. You have this information explosion and values gap. The four of these causes of disequilibrium is a global pastime called stress. And that is why if you are feeling stressed out these days, look at these four causes of this equilibrium. Two rapid changes, technological disruptions, organizational disruptions, information explosion, and so on. That explains why we are usually stressed. So, given this, what do we do? Uh, where the last part of the of the lecture what do you do you go to peter drucker the management guru he says effective professionals know where his time goes they focus on results they build on strength they concentrate uh, their energies using the pareto principle of 80 20 you focus on the 20 percent that produces 80 percent of the results and they make effective decisions or you can read Stephen Covey. He said, there are seven habits of successful people. And he added an eighth one in the last five years. So he now has eight habits of successful people. And that's true. The successful people do know how to execute, execute, execute. Another favorite author of mine is Peter Senge. He, he wrote The Fifth Discipline. And a person who has achieved personal mastery, according to Peter Senge, is one who has a special sense of purpose. I'll change the world. I'll make it a better place. Uh, current reality is an ally. 
You learn how to work with forces of change, not to resist change. You're deeply inquisitive. You're connected to many things, including life itself. You're aware of your weaknesses and your areas for improvement. You're self-confident. You're committed, not just involved. This is what Peter Senge describes as a person who has attained personal mastery. Committed, not involved. As shown by this graphic, you have to kill the pig before you can produce a bacon. That's commitment. An egg, uh, a hen can lay an egg and that is just involvement. So where are you committed or involved? And I've been a student of success for four decades. And my observation is that people who are successful normally have a very clear vision of themselves as a successful human being. The great uh, golfer, Jack Nicklaus, if there's any golfer here, when asked how come he played so well the game of golf, he said, I'm able to visualize the ball, where it goes when I hit it. Uh, visualization is important. Successful people have higher expectations of themselves. If your target is to just pass the class, you settle for 75, passing grade, all your life will be like that. And they go around with winners. One of these days you might notice the kind of people you work with, you, you socialize with, they should be mostly winners. Perseverance. Successful people persevere. Thomas Edison tried 147 times before he perfected the electric bulb. And the Wright brothers flew that contraption 100, 854 times before it flew one mile. And of course, successful people know how to become team players. They have integrity and they have focus. So the survival guide for the 21st century, one, you cannot govern, manage others if you cannot get, you cannot even gov govern or manage yourself. You need to develop a personal roadmap. And that includes clarifying your values, defining your mission and your vision in life. So you have to define success for yourself, make sure they're balanced criteria for that success, and you manage the strategy with the best tools. What do people use to manage their lives? If you want to manage your life better, your work, your relationships, your life, you need a decent tool to make that happen. Invest in a, well, your smartphones have built-in apps that can manage your uh, appointments, your calendar, and so on, your priorities. Whatever it is that you want to do, just invest in a good life management system because it's your life. No? This is the roadmap for the future of the Bureau as articulated by Commissioner Guerrero last November. Grounded on the values of professionalism, integrity, and accountability, and pursuing the mission to strengthen border control, enhance trade facilitation, and improve collection of lawful revenues, the Bureau of Customs envisions that by 2022, it will be a modernized, credible customs administration, which is among the world's best. Big hairy, audacious vision statement. In three years, in three years, you'll be out of the top three, as uh, Secretary Singson is saying. In three years, you'll go all the, you'll finish all of the stages for a performance governance system called PGS. You've just finished phase one, you have to go through phase two, phase three, phase four, and hopefully in the third year, you can be classified as a global hall of fame customs administration. And we have a process to do that. So this is the governance charter of the Bureau of Customs. And this is the roadmap. Again, your values, your mission, your vision. And to achieve that vision, Commissioner Guerrero said that we will need to be excellent in our core processes. So what are those core processes of a customs administration? Pre-arrival processes, assessment processes, payment, clearance, and post-clearance audit processes. 
to support that, I need a strong organization. So you need an OD. I need highly motivated, honest employees with integrity. We'll have to strengthen border security, protection, and safety, and then manage our financial resources. If you're able to do all this in a, an outstanding way, supported by these processes, then you will achieve, you will elevate the Bureau of Customs into a transparent, supportive, responsive, world-class customs administration by 2020. That's why you are going through this workshop among others because this workshop addresses two of the key support processes that need to happen. Strengthen the organization and develop and encourage people to be honest in their jobs, to have more integrity. In other words, a process of conversion. But these are not just words. Hmm? These are commitments to the public that you serve. Now, earlier you had uh, Secretary Singh Son talk about what he did in, <coughs> in the DPWH. But what he did not say is that DPWH also used the PGS to turn around DPWH. Their mission was to provide and manage quality infrastructure and they envisioned that by 2030, DPWH would be an effective, efficient government agency improving the life of every Filipino through quantity. Right project, right cost, right quality, right on time, and right people. So he had all of these strategic objectives, in the same way that Commissioner Guerrero had identified your strategic objectives, but where the rubber meets the road and where Secretary Singson was very effective in, in how he executed this strategy map, which is through the DPWH scorecard. It was very clear, he had eight objectives, and there are certain metrics to know whether he was in the right path. In spite of the fact that your commissioner has committed to all this, it will not happen unless you all support it. From the senior managers, the junior managers, the middle managers, and even the rank and file. Because it needs, it needs the support of everyone, and you cannot have a weak link Secretary Singson was saying, where is the weakest link? Don't be uh, the weakest link. So, just another example of how the PGS can transform an organization from one of the most corrupt, one of the most uh, ineffective, incompetent, overloaded organization to one that is a model for good governance. You can do it. He has done it. You can do it. So, integrity development, and personal governance. What we'll do this afternoon is to come up with your personal roadmap that includes your personal vision statement, your mission statement, and your core values. And then we come up with a scorecard. Even at the personal level, vision is what you seek to be or what you seek. Mission is what you do, who you are, and values are what are important to you. So, in the case of your, the, the whole Bureau, you have these values of professionalism, integrity, and accountability. Those are the most important things, according to your commissioner. And the mission and the vision is to be a world-class customs administration in three years' time. What about financial? And you have to have agreement of the family on the family budget, especially your wife. She has to agree that that is your family budget. And the, and the other thing, the other measure is the amount of money in savings. You can review that on a regular basis, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually. At the end of the year, uh, you may have 100,000 of savings. For the following year, it can be 200,000 in savings. That's financial. Third, physical. So on physical, you adopt a healthy lifestyle. Third, family and social. So you discussed earlier about creating an environment where everyone in the family can have fun and are developed to their full potential. 
One of the things that you can do to start this ball rolling is to look for a spiritual director, a good pastor to talk to, to share your concerns, your issues. Then you adopt norms of spiritual activities on a regular basis and review your performance every day. Finally, apostolate. You make a list of your friends that you want to reach out on a regular basis. Do spend time. Sometimes all it needs is to ask a question from your friend. You have the charter, vision, mission, values. You have the strategic goals in the five aspects of your life. And then the initiatives that you want to start to make sure the, that you achieve those goals. And they come in as a, as a summary of goals, initiatives, and measures. The eight objective, uh, the ten objectives that you worked on today, if you can finalize them, it can become a roadmap, a personal roadmap. If you remember, the roadmap of the Bureau of Customs looks like this. Grounded in the core values of God, country, family, friends, and relatives in a balanced me, and pursuing the mission to know, love, and serve God, my fellow men, and other God's creations. I envision that when I die, I will go to heaven and join my Creator. That's a personal chart. It is important that all the aspects of your life, whether it's career, financial, physical, mental, family, social, and spiritual, have to be even. And you can ride this wheel and road to the common good. On the other hand, if you don't look at this the proper way, you can wind up with this kind of wheel. Because you're highly successful as a professional, oh, your P is a nine. Of course, your financial is a nine. And then your social life is a nine because you're a successful person. You have a lot of friends. But you're in poor health and you can die in the next three years. Or your family, you forget your family. You work too hard, you play too hard, the family is neglected. And then you even forget to go to church. So who do you think will go through life in a smoother way? The one on the right or the one on the left? Right? Correct? This guy will go through life more smoothly with less stresses. He can go faster while this guy rides a roller coaster to, ever, to who, wherever he wants to go. We are in transition that started in 1975 when the industrial age transitioned to the information age with the invention of the computers in 1975. We must regain control of our lives. And the key is balance and single-mindedness or focus. In the concept of time, people having the time of their lives, you need to look at time itself. We have all the same amount of time, 24 hours in one day. No one has enough of time. We cannot save or store time. We cannot control time. We cannot compete with time. We cannot manage time. Time is against us. And believe you, believe it or not, we cannot know the end of our time. So to illustrate that, let's start with this. That's not breakfast and dinner. That is birth and death. This is where you are. Assuming that we all live to be 90 years old, the average of the age of this room today is about 40. So you have 50 years to go. This is 90 centimeters long, representing 90 years of your life. One third of the rest of your life is sleeping. You're gonna do very much while you're sleeping. Then, 16 years of your life, rest of your life, you'll spend on routine items. Commuting, going to the office, going to the supermarket. You have to make the best use of the time. So final points, ladies and gentlemen. You need a plan of life. And we have shown you how to develop a good plan of your life in the same way that Commissioner Guerrero and his leadership team spent two days developing the roadmap for the Bureau of Customs. You cannot do anything less. You're going to just let the leaders do their thing and you don't do your part. Doing your personal roadmap and scorecard aligned 
to the agency or to the to the bureau uh, roadmap is a must if you want transformation to happen in the bureau of customs you start with what's really important to you so we start with values we start with our mission in life our vision of ourselves in our life and you're gonna share this to your to your children to your subordinates in the office if you don't have this roadmap and and the scorecard you're gonna share that you're gonna tell your your children do this do that uh, have this vision you don't even have one yourself you know? so the change begins with yourself as i said at the start of the workshop that the transformation program for the bureau of customs will not happen will not succeed until each and every customs employee is converted is transformed the basic governance unit in any organization is not the leader it is its member of the official family and so i hope that in the last three hours i've given enough reason to be tense tense enough to change to change for a more productive more organized more balanced and a more meaningful and quality life a life of integrity and in closing i'd like to quote the president of coca-cola some years ago robert de Goy goizeta and he said this imagine life as a game in which you are juggling some five balls in the air you name them work family health friends and spirit and you're keeping all of them in the air you will soon understand that work is a rubber ball if you drop it it will bounce back but the other four balls family health friends and spirit are made of glass if you drop one of these they'll be irrevocably scuffed marked nicked damaged or even shattered they will never be the same you must understand that and strive for balance in your life and so if you want to improve the quality of anything quality of your leadership in the customs bureau quality of your work quality of your relationships with your boss with your team with your subordinates relationship with quality of your relationship with your parents and your siblings your loved life your spouse or life itself you must do something different today you've learned three things how to do that one have your personal roadmap have a plan of life and a scorecard to support that second balance you cannot be a 10 in one and a two in others it has to be either 10 all around or nine all around that's balance and third stay focused stay focused you must start today or tonight you don't have much time thank you very much